Hello, this is Jonathan Albin, the Game Market Guru on Just In Time Productions, and we are doing the Games Mastery Series, Season 3. This is Episode 3, The Essence of Storytelling. When we speak of storytelling, of course, we are in reference to the very basics of role play in particular and in particular we're speaking of tabletop role play games so been messing with my screen here a moment at any rate the uh, very element of storytelling that we're speaking of are the essentials of it or in other words what it is at the core stories have the following shared characteristics. In terms of this episode and this session in particular, boy, I'm using that word a lot today. I guess it's because it's on the screen and keeps flashing at me. We will be looking at what a story is and how to boil it down to its greatest effect for in-game use. So, in terms of storytelling, I refer to the purpose of a storyteller, in particular, to be one who provides the collective experience of integration and education through an emotional and entertaining communications method. That's a mouthful. Simply put, as a games master, your story as defined by your game sessions, your series, or your sagas, bring to your participants an integrated, educational, entertaining, emotional, and collective experience. Now we're going to look at each of these points one at a time and express how storytelling meets these various objectives. First of all, I want to speak of storytelling as a collective experience. If you were to do, say, a comparison between someone who is a storyteller and someone who is a lecturer or one who is a teacher, they are very different in their focus and purpose and their, their tactics. So the first thing to note is that in terms of storytelling as a collective experience, the hearers not the teller of the stories, are the focus thereof. What this means, in essence, is that your participants are the ones who are pushing the story, driving the story forward. And therefore, the relevance of the information you provide them to not only who those characters, those players are, but what their personal objectives and agendas are is essential. If you were, for example, telling a Western story and all of a sudden started speaking about lasers or global positioning uh, systems or whatever, you would be irrelevant to the story at hand and therefore your players, your hearers would become lost or disinterested. Also realize that unlike the lecturer or the teacher circuit, storytelling is essentially a two-way street. You have to depend on what your players tell you every bit as much as they need to depend on the information that you provide them. That ebb and flow of communication therefore needs to be coherent, relatable, and understandable and what I reason reason why I'm using all three different words there is that coherency refers to you stating it in a sensible fashion uh, in terms of understandable it's important that your players can keep up with the direction your story is going and ultimately that the information you're providing is easy easy for them to relate to their characters in the situation at hand now, moving from point to point, from beginning to end of a story, through it requires an amount, a massive amount of feedback. You're not only looking at the uh, 
progress as a linear advancement from beginning to middle to end of story, but you're wanting to pro check the progress of other story parameters, which we will go into as we approach them all here in a moment. Ultimately, a good story leaves a memorable impression, a lasting legacy of the story as a whole on the minds of the participants. The better a session is, the more memorable it becomes and the more identifiable each of your story points uh, becomes in the process of telling the story. Now, in addition to having the members be collected and being a part of the situation, you need to find ways of integrating them. And so storytelling as a means of integration provides the opportunity for large players and play groups to gain as much from the story as smaller, more intimate, intimate games groups. So a higher level of belonging among your players is essential. Now to keep a, a hearer, a participant engaged requires an, an individual investment of the participants in the event. If they, as players, are not engaging, are not taking an active part in the story, there are going to be develop challenges and so you have to work to it, make sure that their investment is, uh, is sincere and expressed. Sometimes, however, being a part of something bigger means caring for and desiring for the outcome of the story even if you're not involved. This manifests in a storytelling environment in a role play environment with the players who are not actively in the scene not only paying attention and listening intently to what is going on but not interfering or interjecting adversely during the process. This therefore requires you as a storyteller to bring the disinterested party members, those that are not directly involved, into a state of desiring to be a part of the story and to listen intently. And this is a sign of an exemplary storyteller when your players actively desire to hear what's going on with the other participants. Now, the real positive outcome of being a storyteller, especially in a large group, is that the collective power of multiple minds working on a situation to develop a unified result demands a level of integration that is beyond your individual ability to accomplish. So you want to leverage the high interest participants, those that have much invested and are desirous of an outcome to help draw in the lower interested parties to build a consensus and a communal experience. To do this, you have to kind of dispose of lockstep thinking. In other words, what is good for the goose is not necessarily good for the gander. That which the information that you provide to a incredibly interested participant is going to be different from the amount of data that you're going to provide to those that are less interested or less capable of, inter of acting on that information. So instead you have to move to a power balancing strategy to maximize this integration. It's a lot of Double speak sounds like, but what I'm really trying to say is that when you have a player or two or three that are extremely interested in the story, you want to cause them to look for or engage with the other players so that they are acting as your advocates in getting the collective response that's necessary for the game to move forward. Now, when you are looking at storytelling from the aspect of an educational mechanism, you of course, as in any educational format, want to move from the known information towards that which they do not know. You'll want to use descriptions, therefore, to describe the locations and such. Don't depend on concepts or emotional states to convey the mood and intensity of the situation. This is why in several of my sessions I've t spoken about developing an appropriate vocabulary because as you describe a situation and a setting, utilizing the right vocabulary can enhance and intensify 
the experience that the players have in that environment. Now you also need to take into account, understand and accommodate the skill and desire inclinations of your players to gauge the tempo of the story. If you are moving too quickly, players will quickly fall behind. If you're moving too slowly, players will become bored and disinterested. So to keep your story moving at an appropriate rhythm, you need loops that we've spoken of. And you'd have to decide in advance of your session which uh, lessons you're actually wishing to express to your participants and focus the action in the settings and encounters to enhance the particular lesson you're trying to convey. Now, this also is made much better when you can maintain and use the integration process leading the excited and interested participants to drive forward the information into the minds and internalizing it for those players who are in the disinterested mode in order to educate them. Ultimately it comes down to learning how to eat the elephant. You've probably heard the story, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. So therefore feed your lesson in comprehensible and understandable chunks. Don't overstress the ed educational access of what you're doing because ultimately when people hear they're being educated, they will automatically downplay their interest. So therefore, instead, enhance the experience through intense descriptions that draw the players in and allow them to eat the elephant one bite at a time. Ultimately, I go with that ultimately, I've got, I got some words in my vocabulary that even I need to adjust and adapt. So. Early in the system, you want to reward those that are early adopters and engage those low-speed learners through positive and progressive means, which is asking for consensus, checking on feedback on everyone that's participating one at a time so you have a really clear picture on how the adventure is going and how best to proceed. Now, for me, this next one is kind of critical. If your storytelling is not an emotional outlet for you, you're probably doing it wrong. What this means is that the story needs to be something that's internalized to you, the storyteller. If it's not interesting to you, it certainly won't be to your participants. So make sure that you internalize the message because that will lead to an emotional state that is shared between the storytellers and the hearers. Oh, that's the parallel of the heroes and heroes hearers and heroes, heroes and hearers. At any rate, you want to internalize the message as uh, I think you could probably tell there's a passion in my heart for bringing this information to you and hopefully that is engaged in you in wanting to find out more. Now you need to recognize and reward the attention uh, with attention, those that are emoting as you anticipate, which means if I'm telling a story and I'm nodding and I'm excited and I see players starting to nod, then certainly I'm going to want to get and engage them because that will show other players that the experience is being reinforced by sharing your emotion. Now, occasionally and perhaps in certain game sessions or certain players environments more than others if the response from the players is not meeting your expectations one of two things needs to happen you need to either revise your expectation and act on what you're actually experiencing or you need to adapt your story your excuse me <laughs> didn't mean to sneeze in your ear. You need to adapt your storytelling methodology because you have to realize that the emotional state at the beginning of your series session or saga can shift like the wind. In other words, you may have finished last week's session with a lot of excitement and anticipate that people are going to be just as thrilled this week and then for whatever reasons they come to the table and it's flat. You have to realize that emotion is critical to memory and vice versa. A memory of last week's encounter certainly can incite a memorable, I mean, a, an emotional state, 
but it can also lead to a softening or a reduction in uh, emotional output. So you want to make sure you leave a lasting impression by, by overdoing the emotional reaction to the action in the game so that it's more going to be more easily uh, remembered and emoted upon. Oh, uh, at, at, at the core, therefore, a, a game session should be an emotional connection between the storyteller, the game master, and his participants. Now, speaking of that, we want to make sure that we are enter as entertaining as possible in our storytelling. And this is kind of an interesting point, but the, the truth is everything has a story to tell. If you sat down to play tic-tac-toe, after the third or fourth session, you may have something interesting to share with others about your play experience. Maybe you'll realize that you always start on the left column. Maybe the story is that you're playing to see how close to losing you can get. There's all kinds of different things you can do to relate action to a role play environment and realize that also that every entertainment method out there from a motion picture to a newscast to a sitcom are all trying to tell a story that they intend to, to share. What's really fascinating in terms of role play is that even accidental entertainment can have a lasting effect. I can remember a particular situation wherein I, in my earnestness to get my villains into a fight, declared an initiative rating of a certain value and we began to start the scenario and the situation and the players being very intuitive and having a quick grasp of the rules said hey Jonathan those guys with the halberds that attacked in, in, in round X that's not possible unless those are magic items to which of course I immediately responded well of course they're magic items of course that hadn't been the case until such time as the method was discovered but yes so those accidents create memorable situations and the story of my magical halberds of speed uh, still continues to this day among circles of those people who were present in the play session where that occurred so the accidental entertainment of making a mistake can have a lasting effect and can actually become part of the legacy of your game sessions if you allow them this, of course, means you shouldn't take your ability to entertain too seriously. I mean, sometimes I think I'm a, quite the wit. Other times I'm only about half right. But that's, if you think about it for a minute, it'll, it'll come to you. But just if you, if you expect yourself to be extremely entertaining, odds are you probably aren't being such. On the other hand, that means you shouldn't also doubt that for a second you are the reason people are wanting to hear the story. The reason why people show up to a game session is they have they believe you have a story to tell and they want to find out what that story is. So do not self-doubt and uh, deprive your players of that experience. Instead, you want to look into the player group that you've developed in or, or are building and look for the kinds of entertainment they desire. Find out at their core what it is that they find enjoyable. Give them what they want. If you can't or don't want to, that's fine. Just realize that you will more than likely have to find a different group of players because unless you are matching what they were hoping for, they're going to be drawn on to other things. Now, ultimately, though, this means, and this one's kind of even hard for me to remember, is to never sacrifice the virtues of your story in favor of getting something to be the punchline of a cheap joke. In a recent play experience, I believe I sort of did that, and I'm still to this day ruining it, because what had been an essence of the story of Nikos uh, had become more of a punchline than an actual... Uh, integral part of the story and so I'm still stinging from that but in the future perhaps I will be able to overcome that issue
Well, we're coming to the end of this information pretty quickly, so I might get done with this episode fast enough to do a little bit of vignette at the end. But uh, looking at storytelling ultimately as a communication method means we need to look at that story. And let me make my yellow change here. I needed to make three seconds, two seconds, one second. There we go. Had to make a change in the text visually. All right. Finally, looking at storytelling as an effective communications method. Realize that the purpose for telling a story as compared to the purpose of giving a speech or making a presentation or issuing a lecture is to convey meaning in an understandable and relatable method. Oh, wait. That is the core of every form of communication out there, to convey meaning in an understandable and relatable method. Oh, so storytelling is communicating. Funny, that. The value of a speedy transferal of information is enhanced when the transfer transferal is easily internalized. Ah, now this is where being a storyteller becomes useful because if I convey information to my players in a way that is not only rapid but enhanced with meaning and inter easily inter internalized, I have made my story more effective than other forms of communication. Adding to that, if I make the process of communication entertaining, I overcome the work portion of something being educational and therefore can educate while entertaining. Funny that. Hmm. Now, in a lecture or public speech, the feedback is passive and you've got to depend on physical appearance, physical expression by your participants in a nonverbal way. Although in some cases you can get feedback during a speech Generally speaking, you wait till the end for comments. So a role play environment where I'm constantly getting feedback from my players is a far more effective and much more active feedback process. And therefore it makes the information easier for my participants to find the conveyance efficient and fun. Now, Participants that engage in the active feedback not only make the game move faster, they tend to remember more of it because we actually remember more of what we say than what we heard. Now that's frightening if you think about it. We've got two ears and one mouth, and yet we are more likely to remember something we said than something someone else said. So that means that we should be more diligent in our hearing. And as a good dungeon master, as a good storyteller, you must be good at hearing what your players have to say. By allowing them to speak, therefore, you're giving them a better chance of making the experience memorable for themselves. Now, this actually goes one step further when I speak of after-action reports, post-action recaps, or in my, my, my games, the classic debrief session. Those build the impact of what has happened in the game session because it gives players a chance once again to go over the information and glean as much information and education training as they can from it. Ultimately, the effect of a good story builds on previous sessions. So if you're a storyteller that does one-shot adventures, you still can have impact session over session because your players are getting to hear more of the way you communicate and therefore be able to integrate, integrate what you say with what they know. Now, series and sagas move this effect, this building effect, to the next level and so it becomes even more critical to use good communication, good storytelling to get the message across because then in the, the, the length of a series or on the really large scale of a saga, the players can not only internalize what they know but share that information with others in a way to amplify their experience as well. So. As a quick little recap, ah, there we go. Uh, what we've spoken about today is the means by which a storyteller 
can create a story that brings to your participants an integrational, educational, entertaining, emotional, and collective experience. You want to be able to have your participants share in what you've accomplished, to build on what they know about the story, work together in a group to come to the resolutions by being part of everything and integrating that information you're providing. You're allowing them to learn from the experience and arguably become better teachers themselves as they share both with you through feedback and with each other during gameplay the stuff that they've learned. It allows you and your players to have an emotional release as you alternately provide them with your passion for the story, but also draw on their interest therein. You also provide a, an entertaining environment. Uh, some sessions can be uproariously laughter filled. Others can be incredibly intense, bringing players near unto tears and otherwise giving them an opportunity to really uh, become a part of what the story is. And ultimately you have through your game session achieved the very goal of communication, which is the conveyance of meaning in an understandable and relatable fashion. Well, this has been Jonathan Albin, the Game Market Guru for the Game Mastery Academy uh, Season 3, Episode 3. And I hope to hear from you soon. Feel free to give contact and shoot me a private message or request the information for the uh, Game Mastery Academy Season 1, which is now available through the Academy's website. Uh, just send me a message and I'll link that to you right away. This is Jonathan Albin, the Game Market Guru. Let's keep it rolling.